Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hope you are having a fantastic Monday. We're gonna dive into all things anemia tonight. So if you're fatigued, if you're short of breath, if you have brain fog, if you struggle with neurological sensations, if you have trouble staying asleep at night, these are all symptoms of anemia we're gonna dive in. So stay with me. We're gonna be talking about all the different types of anemias, not just iron deficiency, that's a big myth. A lot of people believe that iron deficiency is the only reason that anemia can happen. And we're going to talk about all the other nutrients, all the other vitamins, minerals that can also contribute to anemia. So again, stay with me to the very end. We're going to dive into that. So without further ado, let's talk about anemia. Now, if you're new to the show, say hello. Let me know where you're watching from to, you know, chime in and say hi, you know, welcome to our community. Let's dive into anemia. So what is anemia? Anemia is basically it's a condition in the in the blood and it generally is an affect on the actual red blood cells so what you're seeing here in this diagram is you're seeing red blood cells okay that's these red discs here i'll outline in black those are red blood cells that's what normal blood cells look like they're biconcave blood cells uh, as opposed to big spheres and what happens is they carry oxygen okay to your tissues. So red blood cells, what happens is they're in your lungs. And when you breathe in the oxygen from the atmosphere, from the environment, the red blood cells are there in your lungs to pick that oxygen up and carry it away to all of your tissues. And you have to understand that oxygen is a rate limiting step for energy. It's how your body generates energy. And if you don't have enough oxygen in your red blood cells being delivered to your tissues, this is a state of anemia, and this can happen for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons is, is you don't have enough red blood cells. So sometimes people don't have an adequate quantity of red blood cells. Sometimes what happens inside of our red blood cells, so if we look at a red blood cell, let me just kind of make a picture here and draw for you. Red blood cell from the side view kind of looks like that. It's a discoid. It's like a, this was a sphere, but imagine smushing in the sides. Those indentations are where the oxygen and the carbon dioxide sit. So again, when you're breathing out, those red blood cells carry a carbon dioxide back to your lungs so that you can exhale. When you're breathing in oxygen, those red blood cells pick up the oxygen and deliver the tissue. So there's this exchange of gas of oxygen and carbon dioxide coming in and out. The oxygen is critical. The carbon dioxide is a byproduct of energy production. So the oxygen we need for that energy. So if you don't have adequate red blood cells, then you have an oxygen delivery problem. It's not that there's a deficiency of oxygen in our atmosphere as much as it is there's a deficiency of your ability to carry that oxygen to your tissue. And again, this can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen because number one, your red blood cells are too low. Now this is important because if your red blood cells are too low, and this is an easy test. Most doctors can measure this with just what's called a simple complete blood count. If you have low levels of red blood cells, again, that's gonna minimize your delivery of the oxygen. For some people, there's a, there's a protein inside of your red blood cells. And let's change our color here. So inside your red blood cells, there's a protein called hemoglobin. Many of you have probably heard of this. This hemoglobin is the protein that helps to carry oxygen. And so hemoglobin is made out of iron, among other things. You need copper to make hemoglobin. And, uh, and if you are low in iron, which is this is the type of anemia most people are familiar with. It's called iron deficiency anemia. It will reduce the quantity of hemoglobin available to carry oxygen. And so you may have plenty of red blood cells, but not enough hemoglobin in your red blood cells to carry that oxygen. So again, we could have low red blood cells. We could have low iron or low hemoglobin. These are different, again, different kinds of anemia and some of them have overlap. So again, anemia is when you don't have the ability to carry oxygen or deliver oxygen to your tissues to generate energy to do the day-to-day -day work of cellular function. That's why people that are anemic are oftentimes short of breath. They feel like they can't get enough air, air hunger, 
and that's why they're oftentimes tired. You can sleep 10 hours, you can sleep 12 hours and still wake up exhausted because there's not enough oxygen traveling into your tissue to generate the energy that your body needs. So when we're talking about anemia, this is in a nutshell, this is what we're talking about. Now, let's talk about some of the symptoms of anemia, some of the, especially some of the ones that are the most common. Fatigue is probably, in my experience, and dealing with people is, is one of the most common. Fatigue and exhaustion, regardless of quantity of hours of sleep. So again, you could get, like I said earlier, you could get 10 hours of sleep, you could get a healthy night's nice rest, and you still wake up exhausted or tired. So if you're waking up, you're finding yourself where you get plenty of sleep, you go to bed on time, you wake up, and you're still totally exhausted, suspect anemia, okay? If you have brain fog, if you find yourself walking into your closet in your bedroom, and you find yourself and you, you get in your closet, you can't remember why you went in the closet. Or if you're in your pantry in your kitchen, you can't remember why you went to the pantry. Like you're, you're going and doing things and you can't remember why or, or what that purpose was. That's brain fog, right? Or you can't put, you can think of the word, but you can't put the word to your tongue or to your lips. Um, so you can, you can think of the name that you want. You know what it is, but you can't bring it to your lips, right? That word recall or brain fog is super common as a symptom of anemia as well. Shortness of breath, as I mentioned, also air hunger, sometimes referred to as air hunger, is a very common symptom of anemia. Dizziness, and this has to do with not enough oxygen getting to the brain. And so a low oxygen to the brain will make you dizzy. This is why, you know, some people when they, I just got back from hiking in the mountains, and so, you know, being at sea level where I live in Houston, there's plenty of oxygen, but when you're, you know, two, three miles high in the sky, there's a lot less oxygen the higher uh, in our atmosphere you go up. And so a lot of people, when they go to altitude, they get dizzy. So like those of you who maybe travel um, and you go to a mountainous region and you start getting dizzy, you start getting shortness of breath, this is because there's less oxygen in the air, right? And, and you're not used to that. And so what people who, who live at altitude, what happens is your body naturally will adjust to that lower oxygen environment by producing more red blood cells. So what I was talking about over here earlier is some people have red blood cells, but some people go to an environment where there's less oxygen. And so they don't have enough red blood cells to carry the lower density of oxygen from the atmosphere. They develop what's called altitude anemias. So if you travel and you get dizzy, this is very, very common to see that happen. Muscle pain, why? Because muscles have to generate energy on a regular basis. Now, those of you maybe have heard, there's a couple different terms. I'm sure most of you have heard of the term aerobic and the other term anaerobic. These terms are, what does this mean? Aerobic, it means with oxygen. Anaerobic means without oxygen. Now aerobic and anaerobic refer to the ways that your muscles produce energy. If there's plenty of oxygen, your muscles can make plenty of energy and you can keep going. So an aerobic activity like jogging or an aerobic activity like, um, like aerob aerobics, uh, where people join an aerobics class where there's, there's not heavy weights involved, and so there's plenty of oxygen. Your body can continue to breathe in that oxygen and your muscles can continue to generate energy for lengthy periods of time. Whereas anaerobic is like weight lifting. It's when you're lifting heavier weights and there's not enough oxygen coming in to support the muscle. So the muscle doesn't have the ability to continue to make energy. So it switches to anaerobic. And when it does that, again, that's because there's not enough oxygen, energy is still made but it's less efficient. So energy production is less efficient and the byproduct is lactic acid builds up in your muscles. So your lactic acid in your increases in your muscles and this, ladies and gentlemen, causes pain, chronic pain. And sometimes it's perceived incorrectly. So sometimes people think they've injured their muscle. Sometimes people think they have muscle perpetual muscle soreness when in fact they're anemic and their muscles are in constant anaerobic metabolism. Again, it's making energy less efficiently and the byproduct of making energy less efficiently is pain in the muscle. So again, just like you can, you can induce anaerobic, anaerobic 
metabolism in your in your muscle by lifting weight sometimes if you're anemic you you kind of create a perpetual state of that anaerobic metabolism and exercise intolerance is another one and it's connected to muscle pain because you can't tolerate lifting weights or doing that exercise because there's not enough oxygen so you pay a massive price because there's just not enough energy to do it and so people get really really wiped out by their exercise they try to exercise for four minutes or five minutes and they can't do it because again there's not enough oxygen to drive the energetics to to, to generate what's necessary to perform that exercise so these are very very common symptoms of anemia now aside from some of these these common symptoms I'd be remiss to not point out a few other things so one of the other things that we'll see it's very common is this right here anxiety this is a big one anxiety is a very common symptom of anemia because there's not enough oxygen getting to the brain so it's it's tied to dizziness and anxiety but if you find yourself like you've not been an anxious person in your life and all of a sudden you're anxious and you can't talk yourself down you might be anemic and that might be driving that anxiety so if those of you that struggle with anxiety ask your doctor to rule out anemias ask for the proper blood work we'll talk about some of that here shortly where you can stick with me we'll talk about that blood work you can go back and request from your doctor but that anxiety is a very very common one the other one is sleep problems and what typically happens with anemia is it's trouble staying asleep what happens is you can fall asleep okay because you're exhausted but your brain won't let you stay asleep um, and it's because when the brain doesn't get adequate oxygen when you're trying to sleep it wakes you up it startles you this is part of you know the anxiety and the, and the startlement it's because there's a there's an adrenaline hormone that is secreted as a result of that lack of oxygen your body will try to use adrenaline to compensate and that will create and drive that anxiety but it will also make it hard for you to get a good night's sleep which can compound the problem sleep won't correct anemia but rest is still important and when you can't stay asleep and you're anxious and you're tired right and all these things are already happening it's just a compounded issue so again anxiety and sleep disturbance are two that are very commonly dismissed or not talked about a lot of times when uh, um, let me back that up again when women go to their doctor uh, to to you know have that conversation and they're they're describing this what are they given they're typically they're given medicine right SSRI selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors this class of medication that doctors will prescribe oftentimes to treat anxiety uh, drugs like Paxil or Prozac are examples there and they'll put a person who's anemic and doesn't really have true anxiety they have biochemical anxiety induced by lack of oxygen and the doctor gives them an SSRI and they don't do better and then that SSRI creates IBS um, a lot of times it can create IBS and it can create weight gain you know how many of you have been in that scenario raise your hands in the audience tonight if you have been in that scenario where you had anxiety you went to the doctor you were prescribed an SSRI and you started gaining weight and developing bowel problems because it was the wrong treatment it's not uncommon to see that happen okay what causes anemia there are several different things that can cause anemia if we're talking about iron deficiency let's change colors again here um, if we're talking about iron one of the things that will cause iron deficiency is gluten does gluten cause anemia heck yes it can cause lots of different types of anemia but iron deficiency is the number one nutritional deficit in people with gluten sensitivity and it's not just people with celiac disease so um, a lot of people believe that only celiacs have this iron deficit problem and it's not true non-celiac gluten sensitivity can also uh, manifest as iron deficient as a matter of fact for many people with gluten issues they have a lifelong struggle with anemia and it's the only symptom that they have and so they go through their life with the anxiety with the trouble sleeping with the chronic pain with the dizziness and the disorientation and the and the and the unending fatigue and it's because they're eating gluten and gluten what gluten does in the stomach draw you a pretty picture here your stomach is lined by a layer of cells actually more than one kind of cell but one of the main cells in the stomach is called a parietal cell and it's the job of parietal cells to secrete acid 
And it's the job of the acid to help absorb the iron. And so what happens with gluten sensitivity, many people have gastritis and that gastritis damages those parietal cells, reducing that person's ability to produce adequate quantities of stomach acid, leading to acid reduction overall and the malabsorption of iron that can come with that, with that acid reduction. So if we're talking about what causes anemia, iron deficiency can certainly cause that. What causes iron deficiency? is the next question. And um, what causes iron deficiency can be gluten. What, what else can cause iron deficiency? Heavy menstruation. So any of you ladies that have had heavy bleeding during your menstrual cycle, this is a common cause of transient anemia where you, know, you, you, hit, you know, go through the month and you hit your, your menstrual cycle and you know, there's this premenstrual issue that, that happens first where there's some blood loss Okay, and then you have maybe some heavy blood loss that comes shortly after that, and there's, that's two weeks of the month, right? And then so then the next two weeks, for two weeks you're trying to recover. Your, your, you know, your bone marrow is trying to produce more red blood cells for the ones that you lost during menstruation, and by the time you finally recover, two weeks to recover, guess what happens? Boom, your cycle's back, and if you're, again, if you're having heavy menstruation, it creates the cyclical transient anemia where for two weeks out of every month you're finding that you're anemic and you don't even really realize it. you just think it's a part of your menstruation well one of the interesting things about a heavy cycle like a heavy blood loss is that we know gluten can cause hormonal abnormalities that can lead to heavy menstruation so very important to understand that connection as well because you can supplement iron in this situation but if you're having heavy menstruation and it's because of abnormal hormones induced by gluten um, or any other, in any other environmental chemical toxin, etc., then you're never going to correct the problem at its core, and you're going to need iron indefinitely. And the problem with too much iron, if you just take iron indefinitely and you don't know why you're anemic, is iron constipates. And so now you're constipated, and all that poop that's stuck in you, right, it's now backing you up, and all those toxins from your poop, if you've got a leaky gut, they just start leaking into your bloodstream, and creating more and more problems. So we don't want that kind of scenario. So again, iron deficiency causes anemia that can lead to, or that can be caused by gluten sensitivity. It can be caused by heavy menstruation. Um, it can also be caused by, um, let's, let's take some of these arrows away and make some room. It can be caused by poor diet. Um, you know, a lot of people go on a vegetarian diet and don't get me wrong, this is not, I'm not saying that vegetarian diet's not the right diet for some people, it certainly is. And for other people, it's not. And when I see iron deficiency is when a person who's genetically doesn't fit the vegetarian diet tries to go vegetarian uh, and then they're not getting enough iron in their diet. So diet, lack of diet quality or poor dietary iron intake. Remember that many of your vegetables like you know, spinach is an example of a food that's rich in iron, but it's bound, the oxalate in the spinach binds the iron, it makes it harder to absorb, it makes it harder, it's not as bioavailable. So we're talking about iron, the, the best way to get it is definitely through animal. Now again, there are some people that do better on a vegetarian diet, but it's the ones that don't, genetically that don't, those individuals tend to develop iron deficiency when they try to go on a vegetarian diet. So again, it's not me, it's not me, like trying to criminalize vegetarians, it's not at all what I mean, because again, some people are matching for that diet, but not everybody who tries that diet uh, match it. So what else can cause anemia? So we've got iron deficiency that can be caused by gluten. Uh, we've got iron loss that can be caused by heavy menstruation, iron loss that can be caused by poor diet. What else? We've got what's called occult blood loss. All right, where would something like this happen? Occult blood loss, could be that, let's say that you take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or Motrin or um, naproxen or aspirin, and you take these, these medicines, right, for your pain, right, which is interesting because what did we just say a minute ago? We said one of the symptoms of of, of anemia is pain, right? So people don't realize they're anemic, but they take the medicine to, to treat the pain without understanding why they're having the pain, right? In this case, the NSAID. NSAIDs destroy the lining of the GI tract. So they damage the gut 
you know, baby aspirin. So this is what commonly doctors will recommend the baby aspirin to thin the blood as prevention. But you should understand that doses of aspirin, a baby aspirin is typically 85 milligrams or so. So it only takes 7.5 milligrams to cause gastric bleeding, occult blood loss through the stomach lining. Okay, so that's less than a tenth, right? So a tenth of the dose of a baby aspirin is enough to create blood loss if you're doing it every day. And if you've got occult blood loss, what does that mean, occult blood loss? That means you are losing blood and you don't even know that you're losing the blood. That's why it's called occult blood loss. And it's happening internally, so you're pooping the blood out, but by the time the, the damage from your stomach comes out in your poop, the blood oxidizes and it's no longer red, so it turns brown. And so you can't even see that it's there. And now occult blood loss is a test that your doctor can run. They can do what's called a fecal occult test to look for the fecal occult blood because this is sometimes another reason why somebody can develop an iron deficiency. So again, this could be caused by drugs, certain medicines, non anti-inflammatories are one class of medicine that can do it. Steroids can do it. And some people combine steroids and NSAIDs and the effect is even worse. So the, the damage to the GI tract can be even greater and cause even greater loss. So these are, again, anything that creates blood loss on a consistent basis is something that increases your risk for iron deficiency anemia. Again, one of the most common types of anemia, not the only type of anemia, but one of the most common. So these are things that you need to be aware of. What else can cause anemia? So we've got deficiency of essential nutrients. Let's make some room for that because that's a big section here. Um, essential nutrients. Predominantly, what are the nutrients? So we just mentioned iron, so we'll put that back up here. But also copper. Copper is necessary to, to form the hemoglobin protein inside your red blood cells. So copper deficiency can create anemia. B vitamins, particularly B12, folate, Vitamin B6 are the major B vitamins that are very, very important for, uh, for formation of hemoglobin and also for the stimulation of new red blood cells. I missed, uh, I missed a mineral uh, up here, uh, and that is also zinc. You got to have adequate zinc to make hemoglobin. So a lot of times, so think about this, what I said a minute ago about gluten. Number one deficiency associated with gluten sensitivity is iron. The number three deficiency associated with gluten sensitivity is zinc. The number two deficiency associated with gluten is vitamin B12. So three, the top three gluten-induced nutritional deficiencies um, affect iron, zinc, and B12, of which all of these together can cause different kinds of anemias. So deficiency of essential nutrients, inability to produce hemoglobin, Iron is necessary to produce hemoglobin. Copper is necessary to produce hemoglobin. Zinc is necessary to produce hemoglobin. B6 is necessary to produce hemoglobin. So those nutrients are very important to make the protein that carries oxygen. Then we have an issue with the structure of red blood cells. So remember I showed you earlier, we kind of drew a picture on the board and we said that a red blood cell typically looks like a, like a squashed or a squished sphere. It's double biconcaved discoid shaped uh, so that it can fit oxygen and carbon dioxide, but sometimes the structure of the red blood cell itself is abnormal. If a, if a normal red blood cell looks like this, sometimes what happens is the red blood cell won't mature. And, and so when it doesn't mature, let's do, do you one more here. Let's make this more sensical for you. So this is bone marrow. This is my rendition of a bone. Please don't make fun of my artistry. But that bone marrow is responsible for producing red blood cells. And when red blood cells are born, they're very large and they're immature. Okay, so this is what an immature red blood cell might look like. Well, when a blood cell matures, it gets smaller. And as it gets to the right size, which is, you know, this discoid shape here, right? Let's move that out of the way. Um, then it takes on a normal shape. So when we talk about structure of red blood cells, when, when part we're talking about did the maturation process of the red blood cell get interrupted in some way? So in order for you to produce red blood cells from the bone marrow, 
This requires B12 and folate. Also requires B6. Okay, requires those nutrients. So if you're deficient in these nutrients, you could actually have a low red blood cell count. But in addition, as this red blood cell matures, for it to properly mature also requires these nutrients. So you need these nutrients not only for the production of your red blood cells, in essence, they stimulate the bone marrow to help you make red blood cells, but for the maturation process of red blood cells to get to the point where they're the right size, the right shape, and they have the right, the right concentration of hemoglobin within, you know, within the red blood cell itself. Remember, that's that protein that helps to attract and carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we get an issue with the structure of the red blood cell, and so that could be partially an issue with it not maturing properly. And sometimes when a red blood cell doesn't mature, it also takes on an abnormal shape. So it might, instead of looking like that biconcave, it might crenate and look more kind of like that. And so it doesn't work as well. Remember in biochemistry, and really in all of life, structure dictates function. So if the structure of the red blood cell is abnormally shaped, it won't perform the function efficiently of carrying the, the actual oxygen very well. So there are different kinds of genetic anemias too. We won't go too deep into those, but things like thalassemia, which is a genetic trait uh, where the red blood cells, basically they don't take on hemoglobin, the shape, the, their hemoglobin is a little bit affected. And then there's things like sickle cell anemia, which is another genetic trait where you get sickle-shaped red blood cells that are poor carriers of, of oxygen, and so this can create anemias as well. But again, these are more genetic. What we're going to focus more tonight on are the things you have control over, which is not the genetic anemias as much as the nutritionally uh, caused anemias. So again, maturation is very, very important. You'll see here, down here, bone marrow's production of red blood cells. As I mentioned here, the bone marrow produces red blood cells, but under the direction of these B vitamins. So these B vitamins become very, very important. And a lot of times what we'll see, is we'll see a person uh, with low red blood cell counts. And let's talk, about, let's talk about some of the lab here. Let me make some space. So what happens when you go to the doctor and they're ruling out anemia? They'll run a test called a CBC, and that stands for complete blood count. And a lot of times you'll get these tests here, like MCV, MCH, you'll get hemoglobin, and then you'll also you'll get red blood cell counts, right? And then there'll be a mark, sometimes there's a marker on that test called RDW, which is red distribution width. Um, and this is really standard for a CBC, what would come on a CBC. So if you went to your doctor and said, hey, doc, can you, I think I might be anemic, can you run a CBC? Uh, and this is what they oftentimes will do. Now, one of the things that will sometimes happen is your hemoglobin will be low, and that might mean that you have an iron deficiency, but it could also mean that you have a copper deficiency. It could also mean that you have a zinc or a B6 deficiency because those nutrients are necessary in order to properly form hemoglobin, you need those nutrients. You also need vitamin C um, to produce hemoglobin as well. And so again, any of these deficiencies can contribute to a reduction in the quantity of hemoglobin. That's why it's important to measure it. Then you have this, this marker up here, it's called MCV, that's mean, mean corpuscular volume. So this is, think of this as the quantity of the size. Remember I showed you down here, I said red blood cells when they're born, they're very large, and then as they, as they mature, they get smaller. Okay, so MCV, a lot of times it'll be high or be, be elevated, and that's because the red blood cell itself is too big, it's too large, okay? And so it's stuck in this immature situation because of a, a lack of B vitamins. It's a very common situation. So a lot of times if your mean corpuscular volume is elevated, it could mean that you have a B vitamin deficiency anemia. And then there's mean corpuscular hemoglobin, which again, it, these two kind of tie together and they mean something very similar. So MCH, um, oftentimes mean corpuscular hemoglobin will be low along with the hemoglobin, and so these two together can mean that these deficiencies are potentially contributing to that. And then, of course, you've got total red blood cell count, which will sometimes also be low, and if it's low, it could mean that your bone marrow is not being properly stimulated, and again, that's predominantly that's B12 and folate that help with that process. And then, um, and this is one of the reasons, this is a side note here, but some people that go on chemotherapy 
chemotherapy drugs can destroy or damage the bone marrow and that leads to low red blood cell counts and so a lot of times with chemo there'll be an anemia that comes with that chemo and people will start you know they'll start developing anemia as a result of that that's why some of the medications that that doctors give with chemo are drugs that stimulate more red blood cell and white blood cell production from the bone marrow directly um, but but that's just a side note and then there's red distribution width and what, what a lot of times will happen is red distribution width will be high. It'll be elevated when there's an iron deficiency anemia. So that's a possibility there. Now, a lot of doctors, you know, this is all they'll run. And if you don't have any problems here, they'll tell you, no, you're not anemic. That's impossible. And that's, that's actually incorrect. Um, this is not all that you want to ask your doctor to run. You would also want your doctor to measure your iron, your total iron binding capacity and your ferritin. If we're talking about just trying to rule in or out iron deficiency as a problem here. So, you know, to properly look at, at whether or not there's an anemia, you need to look at all of these things together because sometimes what happens is your hemoglobin status is normal, but your iron or your ferritin is extremely low. And this is especially true of people with gluten sensitivity. This is actually the thing that we see oftentimes is the biggest problem is that ferritin is very, very bottomed out. It's, it's you know, ferritin ranges, you know, um, anything really less than 20 in a menstruating female is probably too low. Uh, but a lot of times we'll see ferritin, you know, five, six, seven, eight, somewhere really, really super low, which ferritin is your stored iron. It's how your, how your liver stores iron so that when your iron storage in your blood, when your blood iron is low, it'll, your liver will distribute iron through ferritin into the bloodstream to kind of catch you back up. But if your ferritin levels are super low, you have no reserve tank for iron. And so you're more prone to anemia. And this, again, this is a lot more common in females because of the menstruation cycle. Menstruating females, they have programmed blood loss every month and, you know, some worse than others, depending on, uh, you know, the heaviness of the menstruation. But these are tests that you definitely, if you're trying to rule out anemia, you can't stop short at a CBC. You've got to add on these components here, the iron, the total iron binding capacity, the ferritin. You've also got to ask your doctor to look at your B12, your copper, and ceruloplasmin, which is a, another marker for copper. You got to have them and ask them to look at your zinc, your B6, and also your folate. Now there are other things that we'll add to this list too, like vitamin C and vitamin E because deficiencies in these two nutrients, not only, well, vitamin C deficiency can cause, uh, can cause an anemia in, in multiple different ways. And one of the ways that it can cause anemia is, is that low vitamin C makes it hard to form hemoglobin. But another way is that the red blood cells themselves, again, drawing you another picture here, this membrane around the cell, sometimes it's too weak. It's, it's, it's not strong and it's not, um, it doesn't have integrity in its structure. And so that membrane will rupture. It'll rupture too easily. And if that happens, the cell breaks too easy. We call that hemolytic. Hemo meaning blood, lytic meaning to lice or cut. Hemolytic anemia means your red blood cells, membranes around them are very weak and they break open too easy. And this is oftentimes a cause caused by low antioxidant function. Vitamin C, vitamin E deficiency can both cause hemolytic anemias. And this is something that doctors very, very rarely look at. They very rarely check um, for, for premature lysing of red blood cells. And so these are all things that you wanna ask you know, your doctor to check into if you suspect you have anemia. Again, going back to the, you know, the prior slide where we talked about the symptoms, if you're struggling with these symptoms and there's no discernible reason why you should be and you've ex kind of exhausted all medical reasons why these symptoms might exist but now you've you've heard this information you're thinking there may be a potential possibility you have anemia ask your doctor to do good diligence in lab testing to try to help you determine whether that's going on so this is kind of a in addition to what we just talked about we mentioned forms of anemia right and we said um we were talking about these lab markers, right? So MCV, what is that? That's mean corpuscular volume. 
Again, it's the size of the red blood cell. When the red blood cells are too big, as you see in this diagram here, those red blood cells are bigger than these red blood cells, okay? This is called macrocytic. Macro means too large. That means these red blood cells never properly matured, so they never got to the right size, okay? And then you have here, you have microcytic, meaning these blood cells, red blood cells are too small. So generally with a microcytic anemia, whereas a macrocytic anemia typically is a B12 and a folate deficiency, and again, this is typical, a microcytic anemia is typically a iron, zinc, copper, or B6 deficiency because those nutrients are necessary to form hemoglobin. Remember, inside that red blood cell, you have that protein hemoglobin. But if you're not forming enough hemoglobin, then the red, then the red blood cell is too small. That hemoglobin doesn't bulk up the cell, so the cell actually is microcytic. It's too small, and it's also hypochromic, meaning it's pale. The color of the cell itself is very pale because hemoglobin is a rich red color. And, uh, and so the cell becomes too small, and it becomes too pale, and doctors can, can test for these types of things. Again, looking at markers like MCV and MCH and MCHC, et cetera, and can get an idea of whether or not that anemia is, is microcytic hypochromic, which would make us think more along the lines nutritionally of these nutrients, or whether that's a macrocytic anemia, which would make us think more along the lines of B vitamin deficiency. And then there's hemolytic anemias. And as I said before, these red blood, you can see these red blood cells, they break too easy. They break open, they break apart. And this is oftentimes accompanied by antioxidant problems. Um, Antioxidant problems like vitamin C, vitamin E is an antioxidant, but also the, the membrane around your cell, that membrane needs omega-3 fats, and it also needs what's called oleic acid fat. The oleic acid is a type of fat. You get it from almonds and avocados, um, predominantly, and olive, olive oil. But these fats strengthen cell membranes. And if you don't have, if you've got a deficiency of these fats, these membranes around the cells become too weak and they'll lyse prematurely. And that will lead to, with hemolytic anemia, generally we'll see jaundice. And if you don't know what jaundice is, jaundice is a yellow discoloration of the skin. And that's because there's a pigment inside of your red blood cells called bilirubin that will turn the skin yellow. So if your cells are breaking open too quickly, that pigment will build up into your skin and to the sclera of your eyes and it will cause yellow discoloration. You'll see this, some you probably, those of you who've had children may have experienced the baby uh, having jaundice because their liver wasn't mature enough yet. And uh, what was happening is that bilirubin built up in their skin. And that's why in the hospital with newborn babies, they put them under these UV lights because UV lights help to break down bilirubin appropriately. But we'll see jaundice in hemolytic anemia as a consequence. So if your skin is turning yellow, if somebody's saying, hey, why is your skin turning yellow? Why do you look more yellow? And just, why did the whites of your eyes, why are they turning yellow? You might suspect hemolytic anemia as a potential reason why that could be happening. Okay, so said before that gluten could definitely contribute to anemia. And this is one of the big ways, right? It's gluten-induced nutritional deficiencies. Now I've hammered this home in a number of, of shows and a number of videos where we know gluten can cause malabsorption, gluten can cause damage to the intestinal lining, gluten can cause inflammation that causes your body to burn through more nutrients. But these are some of the main nutritional deficiencies that we know gluten definitely can cause that can also lead to anemia. So again, what do most doctors do? They focus only on iron and they forget about these other nutrients. They don't even measure, they don't, they don't do their diligence, right? It's predominantly, it's because most doctors don't study nutrition. It's pretty rare to find a doctor who knows anything about nutrition uh, because it's just not something that's taught in the curricula of most medical schools. So that being the case, they'll focus on the iron and they'll not look at any of these others, but you still may be anemic, just not iron deficiency anemic. So it's important to understand that measuring nutrition is very, very important. Now here's what some research studies show, can going gluten-free prevent anemia um, or can it reverse anemia? Well, one study found that female celiac patients recovered, and we're talking about iron in this study, iron deficiency, is that in, the, in this research study, 78% of the women recovered from their anemia just by going gluten-free. 
They didn't supplement iron. They didn't have to eat you know, a pound of liver every day. They didn't have to do those things. They simply just had to get gluten out of the diet. When the gluten-induced gut damage stopped, their gut started to absorb the iron properly again, and it corrected their anemias. Now, there's 22%, though, that didn't get corrected. And that's part of the problem is that that lack of correction in that other 22% is because sometimes the damage is, is intense. Sometimes the damage is extensive, the GI damage, and it can take time for that to heal. Um, and sometimes it requires supplementation to overcome. And it could be oral supplementation. In many cases, oral works just fine. Uh, anywhere between 50 and 75 milligrams a day of iron, typically in an amino acid chelate, like a bisglycinate or something like that, um, is enough to get good supplementation without overdoing it. One of the problems with taking iron if you don't need it is it's oxidative and iron can be very damaging. So it's important that you don't just go and take a bunch of iron without actually finding out whether or not iron deficiency is your problem. But the damage can be extensive. Supplementation can correct it. In some cases, you gotta have transfusion. I mean, you gotta get blood pumped into you to correct the anemia. Um, this, I've seen this be the case, you know, 20 years in my, my practice, I've seen this be the case a handful of times where people just weren't responsive to diet change because the damage was too extensive and supplementation wouldn't do it. So the transfusion kind of was the thing that got them over the hump. So, you know, any one of these things could be important, but again, gluten can cause anemia and going gluten-free can correct anemia. And again, in this research study, in the vast majority uh, of the patients. So, so again, that's important to understand because some people, they, they go to their doctor and what they do is they find out they're anemic. And this is, let me, yeah, let me go ahead. And, well, let me make some room here. If they go to their doctor, they find out they're anemic, get the right blood test, they're anemic. So now what? They're anemic. So the doctor recommends iron, and that's it. And then you take the iron, and you're still anemic. So then the doctor says, more iron. And you do that, and you're still anemic. Well, there's a name for this. It's called refractory anemia. The bigger question here is taking more iron is not going to correct why you have an iron deficiency if, if your iron deficiency is being caused by damage to your gut's ability to absorb it or internal bleeding or something along those lines. Where iron will correct an anemia is if your diet is truly devoid of adequate quantities of iron to sustain adequate red blood cell and hemoglobin production, but iron by itself if you have an iron deficiency, the next question out of your mouth to your doctor should be, why is my iron low? What are all the reasons why, it, why my iron is low? You know, and can we investigate those reasons or those potential possibilities? Because again, this right here, anemia, for a huge percentage of gluten sensitive individuals, is the only symptom they'll have. And this, it's this anemia that actually ultimately, 20, 30 years down the road, leads to the diagnosis of gluten sensitivity. You don't wanna wait 20 or 30 years struggling with anemia, low energy, muscle pain, et cetera, to get a right answer. And this is why, you know, if you've been diagnosed with anemia and your doctor just says, hey, just take iron and call me in the morning, you need to ask more deeper, you need to ask deeper questions. You need to say, well, why, does, why do I have the anemia? Is it nutritional? Can we measure my nutritional status? Could it be potentially that I have occult blood loss? Can we do a fecal occult blood test? Is it possible that I have an inflammatory bowel issue? Can we you know, maybe rule out inflammation within my gut as a potential reason as to malabsorption of iron? Because especially if you eat foods that contain iron, if you eat you know, red meat, if you eat, um, you know, if you, eat, if you eat liver, if you eat organ meats, you should be getting adequate iron within your diet. You don't need to mass dose iron to get adequate quantities, but generally where there's an iron deficiency anemia is because somebody has an underlying problem and it just hasn't been disclosed or discovered yet. So just make sure that you don't just start popping iron 
for the sake of popping iron without understanding why you have that de deficit. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Yeah, so Elizabeth says, I carry the sickle cell trait. Is that the reason why I suffer from chronic anemia? It's hard to say, Elizabeth, because if you just because you carry the sickle cell trait doesn't necessarily mean that your cells are sickle shaped. And that's where you'd want to get what's called a morphology test. So ask your doctor to do morphology. Uh, morphology just refers to what's the shape of your red blood cells. Are the, are the red blood cells abnormally shaped? Are they sickle shaped? If, if you do morphology and you see sickle shaped red blood cells, then the answer is yes. If you do morphology and you don't see sickle shaped blood cells, then you've got anemia for a different reason. Can destruction of parietal cells also cause ulcers? Judith wants to know. Um, yes, Be, remember destruction of the stomach lining, the tissue itself, you know, once you break through that mucosal layer and you start damaging the cells underneath, you run the risk of the development of ulcers, so absolutely. So what does it mean to have normocytic normochromic anemia? Uh, I can't see the rest of the question. I, I when does that happen? Um, so normocytic normochromic anemia is, you, so you can have normal shaped and normal colored red blood cells. So your MCV and your MCH and your MCHC could all be completely normal, but you're still iron deficient. Uh, and you can still be anemic. So that's one example of having uh, iron deficiency can cause normocytic, normochromic. So can a vitamin B6 deficiency. So there are different things that, that definitely can contribute to normal, uh, norm, normal looking red blood cells and normal colored red blood cells, even though they're, they're not functioning fully. Isn't a high ferritin level indicative of cancer? Jane wants to know. Not necessarily. I mean, iron, high ferritin. So ferritin, when it's, when it's elevated, is a, is a marker for inflammation. It's known as an acute phase reactant protein. So when the body's super chronically inflamed, we'll see a ferritin levels climb really, really high. And so iron, not, that, that, you know, is cancer a disease of inflammation? Yes. Can people with cancer have high ferritin? Yes. Does having high ferritin mean you have cancer? No. You could have high ferritin for a number of different reasons. Again, it's a marker for inflammation more than it's a, 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 a kind of a marker directly for cancer. Uh, let's see, wanting to do more intermittent fasting, um, plus 24 hour fast. How do you maintain your weight? I don't want to lose more, uh, more weight, female 5'8", 143. Uh, would 135 to 130 be too skinny? I feel small. Um, look, I think, well, I can't answer that question specifically without actually measuring your body fat composition because weight is relative. I mean, you can have a person who's thin but has high levels of body fat and what that we would call skinny fat. You can also have a person that's, that um, appears, uh, uh, appears obese on paper, but because they're so well muscled, they're, 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 you know, their, their body mass index is, is high, but because they're well muscled, they're not really. But again, if you're, trying, if you're trying to discern what your weight should be, there's not like a magic perfect number there. I think you have to be comfortable in your own skin first and foremost, but where we look to see with fasting creating a problem is if you're losing muscle. If you're losing muscle mass, if you're muscle wasting, um, that's where the problem really starts to set in. You don't wanna to fast to the point that your body is eating into your muscle, into your protein, to, to basically catabolizing your body to generate and drive energy production. Um, that's, that's when you've gone and taken it too far. Uh, let's see here. How long can it take for the body to heal from gluten damage after sh uh, stopping gluten completely, still struggling with the anemia symptoms, fatigue, weakness, exercise intolerance, and lethargy? That's a good question, Tamara, and, it, and it's different for different people, but as a general rule of thumb, um, if the diet is really dialed in and there aren't any other problems and everything is, is what it should be in terms of nutrition, you know, to heal the damage that's caused by gluten, 18 months to three years fully for, for recovery because in, in, part of that depends on how long you've been eating gluten. So like if you've been eating gluten your whole life, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you, you don't heal that in six months. You, you're not going to take 30 or 40 years of damage and correct it in six months. The body's dynamic, but it's, in many cases, it needs multiple cellular turnover in order to, to fully get restorative strength back to it. So, it, it, you know, I don't want to give you an exact answer. I, 
apologize I can't do that, but because everybody's different, but 18 months to three years, depending on other variables as well. Um, Dr. Osborne, please help. I have pelvic organ prolapse. So you got a prolapse, I'm going to assume pro, a prolapse uterus. Uh, I'm in so much pain, I need advice. You need to get with, a, a, if, it's, if it is a uterine prolapse, you need to get with, with somebody who specializes in the physical therapy and the rehab around that because there may be some muscular issues that need to be addressed. A lot of times when women have that issue, it's, excuse me, it's, it's muscular atrophy in, the, in those pelvic muscles and that requires you know, a specific set of types of exercises. And so I would just encourage you to follow up with, a, with an expert who specializes in pelvic floor exercises. Just look that term up, pelvic floor expert, and, uh, and find somebody who might be able to help you there. Now, there could be some other biochemical issues that have led to some of that, and that's something you'd, you'd wanna get with somebody who's really well-equipped with nutrition to help you understand that and navigate that a little easier. Star says, my husband is on his second round of iron infusions. Excited to see this live. Glad you're here, Star. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll take away a lot of value from, from what we've talked about tonight for your husband. Uh, what does DQ8 homozygosity, um, I don't, the question doesn't make sense. What is, what is DQ8 homozygosity is present? I think you maybe meant to say, what if DQ8 homozygosity is present? Uh, what does that mean on labs? If you're double DQ8, it basically means that you have the genes for gluten sensitivity. And then if you eat gluten, then genetically speaking, your body is going to react to that gluten consumption by producing an inflammatory cascade that leads to damage over time. So um, people that have positive genetic markers for gluten sensitivity, in my opinion, should not be consuming gluten unless you want to induce inflammation. So the double DQ8 like that, those, those are... Those are both gluten-sensitive markers or genetic alleles that, um, again, would predispose you to reacting to gluten in a negative way. Uh, let's see here. Love that, Sherry. Thanks for your kind words. She says, hello from Long Beach. Um, you're my hero. Thank you for giving me my life back. Well, I'm just glad that you took the time to, you know, to, to, to learn. And you got your life back. You just used me as the tool. So thank you for using me as a tool and get out there and spread the word. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Question about vitamin D mega dosing. Um, yeah, so if you if you're trying to get your vitamin D levels up, I know a lot of a lot of folks right now are, are you know concerned with COVID and the vitamin D levels. So we just did a story on the news about high dose vitamin D. Um, but yeah, we talked about that. We talked about, uh, Witty, we talked about high dose vitamin D and I would encourage you to go, we did an entire show on vitamin D and maybe we can pump that into the feed for you. Um, uh, but if you're vitamin D, if you're high dosing it and it's not correcting, you need to, get, you need to follow up where the doctor is qualified uh, because there could be some other issues that are going on and just perpetually taking high doses of vitamin D might not be a great move for you. Can anemia cause thyroid issues? It can. Um, one of the things that iron rusts, iron is necessary for the conversion of T4 to T3. T4 is inactive thyroid hormone. T3 is active thyroid hormone and you need iron to make that conversion happen. And so some people have iron deficiency anemia. They have low iron that also is impacting their thyroid hormone conversion. So yes, it's very possible that the two can go hand in hand. So TC's asking about, uh, yeah, I'd mentioned before that I, you know, for me, I had a chronic cough. Um, that's part of one of my symptoms of gluten exposure. And uh, for me, as far as the chronic cough is concerned, it's gone. As long as I don't get exposed to gluten, I don't chronically cough. I used to cough every night before bed. It was just a non-productive chronic cough. Um, but that was a, a gluten-induced issue. And I see that a lot in the clinic. I see that with a lot of folks. So oxalates, Barb is asking about high oxalates and anemia. So it's, it's not necessarily that high oxalates cause anemia. It's that when people eat foods, uh, especially people who aren't equipped for the vegetarian diet, when they eat high um, foods, high grain foods or spinach or other greens or, or, or um, plant-based foods that are really, really high in oxalates, oxalate 
is a, is a crystal structure that can bind other metals. It can bind calcium, it can bind iron, make them harder to absorb. So there is a connection between a high oxalate diet potentially contributing to a reduced ability to absorb the iron in the diet that you're consuming. Um, but it's, 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 not, it's not that oxalates per se cause iron deficiency in everybody. So I wanna be real careful to, to not uh, tell people to avoid eating any food with oxalate for the fear of an iron deficiency anemia. Can mold and toxins cause anemia? They can, Donna. Um, you remember mold, mold causes chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, chronic inflammation will contribute to lots of different problems. Let's change our color here. But mold, mold kind of really, what it does is it creates environmental exposure to mold, creates an increase in chronic inflammation, which increases demand on nutrient stores. And so your body utilizes essential nutrients to put out the fire. Think of these nutrients almost in a sense as like your fire truck. And if you're chronically inflamed because you're chronically in mold, then your body is going to burn more through its nutritional storage to try to help deal and cope with that inflammation. Uh, so for example, one of the things we know chronic inflammation will reduce is vitamin C, right? Vitamin C, why? Because vitamin C is the, is the nutrient necessary to help your body produce cortisol, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, which are how you respond to inflammation. And so um, longer you have inflammation, the more of your own vitamin C you're going to burn through. Vitamin C has a very short half-life, and if you're not getting adequate quantities in the diet, it becomes very easy to become vitamin C deficient. But in addition... Um, the inflammation itself will drive that process. This is why nutrients are so important. That's why every, every Monday night you hear me harp and harp and harp on vitamin and mineral status is the number one piece of medical information you could have about yourself. It's number one. It is the priority. It is the foundation of what you need to understand about what's going on first and foremost if you're struggling with a chronic illness or a chronic inflammatory process. Because if you don't have adequate nutrients and you're inflamed, it's very, very hard from diet alone to get adequate nutrition to compensate for the massive level of inflammation to get your body where it needs to go. So understanding that baseline nutritional inflammation becomes very important. Okay, um, an iron supplement, Elizabeth wants to know, please suggest an iron supplement, ultra iron, Elizabeth. Um, you can check that out over at glutenfreesociety.org. We'll put a link up in the feed for you. And Ultra Iron has, it's not just iron. It has some of the other uh, factors that are necessary to produce and mature red blood cells. So it's more than just iron. That's a, it's a blood building supplement. Uh, what do I think of colloidal silver? Um, depends. It depends on what you, you, know, what you are trying to use it for or what, what the application is going to be. My daughter was just diagnosed with anemia. Her doctor said to take 220 milligrams of iron. Boy, that's a pretty high dose. Um, let's see, where's the rest of that? I bought your iron, uh, let's see, I bought your ultra iron. She has been taking it for a week. She just switched from taking it at night to taking it in the morning, but got very nauseous. Should she just continue to take it at night? Yeah, so one of the things about iron is especially if you don't take it with enough food, is it can cause nausea. Um, and the nausea can be quite, quite uncomfortable. So anytime you're supplementing, and when I say 225, that's really high. And that may be part of the problem is that that, that seems like an awful high level. I, I get lots of folks with anemia, and we generally correct, correct an anemia with anywhere between 50 to 100 milligrams of iron a day. And that's if, you, you know, if you've got the diet dialed in, if you've got... Um, if you've got the inflammatory parameters dialed in, that, that generally doesn't take more than that, usually. So 225, in my opinion, seems a little bit high. Now, that being said, um, that may be the dose itself may be contributing to some of the nausea, but it also may be that she's just not getting enough food down on her stomach first. So the best way to take iron is to eat, then take the iron, then eat a little bit more. And that way you're buffering that iron like in between your food sandwich so that it's not just exposed to the bare stomach or intestine. 
Serena's asking, what does it mean if iron is okay, but ferritin is on the lower end? Well, if ferritin's on the lower end, it may not mean anything, um, especially if your iron levels are okay. Now, um, best thing to do in that type of situation is just to kind of keep an eye on the ferritin, you know, maybe on a three to six month interval to, to just make sure that it's not dropping lower. Remember what ferritin is. Ferritin is stored iron. So if your blood iron is okay and your stored iron is okay, even if it's on the lower end, unless you're having really, really heavy menstrual cycles, probably doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot in terms of that in and of itself being an anemia. Anthony wants to know, he's asking about glucose tolerance tests. So apparently in Australia, the glucose drink is made from dextrose, which is corn derivative. My question is it possible to get a false positive result if you are intolerant, um, allergic to corn? Is there an alternative test uh, drink that doesn't contain gluten, rice, corn, or soy? And more broadly, can gluten insensitive people cause blood sugar spikes if gluten is reintroduced into one's diet? Yeah, so gluten can, so that's a lot of questions there, but let's answer the first one. The first one is I'm gonna give you my opinion. The glucose tolerance test is a total waste of time. All right, and this is a test, the glucose tolerance test is used oftentimes, I'm surprised to hear you talk about it, Anthony, uh, is usually done on women who are pregnant and they do what's called a four hour GTT, glucose tolerance test, where they give you, basically they give you sugar that's derived from some type of grain, typically, typically corn, and they, they give you a massive quantity of the sugar and then they make you sit there for four hours and then they draw your blood a couple of times. And they measure the glucose response to drinking basically a glass of sugar, which, okay, we should see when you drink a glass of sugar, your blood sugar is gonna go up, right? But what doctors like to do in this situation is they like to, with pregnant women specifically, they like to diagnose gestational diabetes and you know it's it's important to know if you're pregnant you're a woman if you have gestational diabetes but a lot of times what's the point of running a test like what's the point of doing a test like this the point would be to make a diagnosis right can you not well okay whether it's whether you're a guy or a girl whether you're pregnant or whether you're not pregnant whether it's gestational or whether it's just type 2 do you need a four-hour glucose tolerance test to come to the conclusion that you have gestational diabetes or that you have type 2 diabetes? And the answer is no, you do not need to put your body through the trauma and the stress of drinking corn syrup, especially if you're gluten sensitive, um, to, so that a doctor can tell you you're diabetic. And what, it, because here's the thing, what if you are diabetic? What's the solution to diabetes? What's the solution? Diet change and exercise and maybe nutritional supplementation if you're deficient in certain nutrients like zinc or chromium. Um, but that's the solution. So you can get this answer without the trauma of this test and you can induce diet change and exercise regardless. So like if you even think you're on the fence with diabetes, you should be doing this anyway. Um, so again, the test, you know, the, the, ultimately when we, when we run any kind of test, you know, the thought in, in my mind when I, when I order a test on somebody is, will this test give me information that inherently changes the nature of what we need to do in order to get this person healthy? Will this test hurt that person? Okay, those are questions that have to go through the mind of a doctor and they should go through your mind too because if the test is harmful uh, and doesn't really bring any kind of grand solution um, that you can't already start inducing, then what's the purpose of putting yourself through the four hours of stress and trauma and drinking a poison to satisfy a doctor? Um, and that, you know, I, I, this, this very thing happened when my wife was pregnant with my, with my youngest son, um, who's now a young man. He, uh, sh the doctors insisted, they wanted, they insisted to do this test. And I, and I, and I insisted that they weren't going to do the test. And I put my foot down and they, they were very upset with me. And I said, look, you know, give me a medical waiver. We'll sign your waiver and, uh, and we'll move on. And that way you're not held liable. Should we, you know, have a diabetic problem that you couldn't detect or identify. But the, the bottom line was here was here is this is super easy. And if we're suspecting any of this at all, we're already going to do this regardless of the outcome of the test, because if the test comes back negative, but there's still suspicion of diabetes, you're still going to want to do diet 
change in exercise regardless. So anyway, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jim, what, what should we do to heal ulcers? Well, wow, these topic, these questions are all over the map tonight. So if you've got an ulcer, well, you know, ulcers, depends on what's causing it, Jim. I mean, there's H. pylori bacterial infection that can cause ulcer. Gluten can cause ulcers. Food allergens can cause ulcers. Other chemicals in food, caffeine can contribute to ulcers. Heavy coffee use can contribute to ulcers. The best way to heal an ulcer is to find out what caused the ulcer and remove that irritant first. Right, and then you can do nutritional support and layer that in on top. So you can do things like uh, we have. A, we actually have a nutritional support product called GI Soothe, uh, is one that I would recommend in that situation where it helps kind of lay a. Uh, it helps soothe and it helps coat the stomach, so that if you do have an ulcer, that as you put that coating down, uh, it's less irritated by the by the acid bathing over the ulcer but ultimately to heal an ulcer you've got to know what caused it so no supplement no drug you know whether it, again whether it's a proton pump inhibitor or nexium or something like that none of that is going to heal an ulcer if you don't know what caused it they might reduce your symptoms they're just not going to heal it permanently uh, heather's asking how long after going grain free should i see an improvement in my ferritin levels um, I have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, generally speaking, three to four months is, is a pretty good range to see a bump. If you're not seeing that bump, there may be some other type of issue that you're not, you don't have quite figured out. Um, so question, how can I get your book? Doc, how can I get your book? Amazon, you can go to Barnes & Noble, you can get it on Walmart, you get it at Target, but we'll put a link up in the feed for you um, where you can get a, a copy of No Grain, No Pain. Uh, Anna wants to know, can anemia be related to geographical tongue and uh, Lermite sign? Yes, it can be, particularly geographic tongue. It's not uncommon to see uh, that association. Kalapi wants to know, values of ferritin safe for thalassemia? Um, again, if, as long as your ferritin levels are normal, you know, 25 to, to 90 is a pretty good place for ferritin to sit for most people whether you have thalassemia or not um, you know that you know that whether your ferritin in essence if you have thalassemia it's not ferritin's important but it's 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 not the only thing that's important so don't put too much focused attention on it just make sure it's normal when you get it checked out can caffeine let's see can caffeine inhibit absorption uh, caf what caffeine does is it, it's a, it's, for some people it's a GI irritant. So many people are sensitive to caffeine and it can damage the GI tract lining. And we've known that for a long time. But, but if, you're, if you're like the one, a cup, one cup a day drinker of coffee or tea that is caffeinated, you know, most people can get by with that. Okay, where people really get in trouble with caffeine is they're doing like a pot. They're doing two, three, four, five cups. They're doing a couple cups in the morning, a couple cups at lunch. Or they're buying the garbage stuff. Like you go through the drive-through, you know the famous place that most people buy their coffee from. That 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 place, in my opinion, is toxic garbage. You're putting that in your body. You don't love yourself enough. You need to throw it away. Um, that stuff is GMO. That stuff has all kinds of chemicals added to it. And it sometimes it's not the caffeine, but it's how the bean is uh, how the bean is roasted, and it's the other chemical ingredients that they add to the bean so that they can get a consistent taste, no matter what franchise you're buying it from. And that to me is scary. Having the ability to replicate the taste no matter where you're at in the world. Coffee grown in one soil should not taste exactly the same as coffee grown in another soil. Even coffee grown in the same soil but harvested at different times of the year shouldn't taste exactly the same. And that is very hard to accomplish unless you're adding a bunch of nonsense to it to, to create that same taste. Uh, what can I eat for the iron with no teeth? Um, Kristen, what you can do is you can take liver and you can puree it. Um, you can puree that liver and you can add it to like bone broth or some other type of, of juice and you can drink some of it and you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a lot. You can do a couple of ounces a week to get a good quantity of liver in you that it's going to give you some iron. Um, you can also, if you're, if you follow more of a plant-based type of diet, you can, you can juice, right? You can you really more specifically, not so much juicing as pureeing, you, but you can puree some of those vegetables instead of juicing and you can get some of the iron that way as well. If you are on a vegetarian diet, one of the ways to enhance iron absorption, in other words, improve iron absorption, is to take vitamin C with it. Now, vitamin C, particularly ascorbate, buffered ascorbate, works really, really well to improve iron absorption from plant-based 
food items. So, so that again, those of you who are vegetarian can, can check that out. Is there a connection between low vitamin D and low iron? Uh, currently recovering from both and recently gone gluten-free. I mean, there are a lot of correlations, but there doesn't have to be. I mean, so for example, low iron and low vitamin D are very common nutritional deficiencies in somebody with a gluten issue. And so that could be the correlation. It could just be that simple. Uh, there, are, there are lots of correlations. It could be malnutrition. It could be gastrointestinal inflammation. Remember, nutrient deficiencies don't typically come in singular uh, appearances. They usually come um, in conglomeration with one another. So I, I can't recall a time I've ever done nutritional testing on a patient where we found only one deficiency. It's usually a handful of deficiencies that, that show up. So then that can happen for a lot of different reasons. A person can be deficient because you know, with vitamin D, lack of sunshine, lack of dietary intake, chronic inflammation, GI inflammation, malabsorption, they're just too many different variables that can cause nutritional deficit to say this is why those two are in a pair for you. Uh, Diane, I'm both gluten-free and diagnosed with gastroparesis and had, uh, had my gallbladder removed. I've been placed on um, domperidone. What is your thought on this medicine since literally eating anything is becoming impossible? Um, you know, I, I would say you need to be gluten-free for a time and then you maybe need to talk with your doctor about reevaluating it. I mean, part of the reason why many people with a gluten situation end up you know, not being able to eat is because their, their gut's rejecting the, the concept of eating because it's so damaged. And when the gut's damaged and you put food in it, now it's struggling in a damaged situation already. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of people, intermittent fasting works really, really well, where you, you, know, you fast in this window of 16 to 18 hours and you eat all your meals in this window of six to eight hours. And that way your gut gets to rest. But if your appetite's not great too because of the, the damage, then that, that rest allows you you know, to not just, you know, some people say eat three square meals a day or eat six small meals a day. Now, one of the best things to, to make a comeback from chronic gluten-induced gut damage is really is to do intermittent fasting on a regular basis. I'm a big, big believer in intermittent fasting. As a matter of fact, my own, uh, my own personal life, I typically don't eat breakfast at all. Um, and I work out in the morning. So I work out early in the morning, don't eat breakfast, typically don't eat until around noon or one. That way I get a good 18 hour, 16 to 18 at least, hours of, of just break from my GI tract. Okay, I think I got that one answered. Can anemia be really, oh, see, I answered that one as well. Um, what do you recommend if one is vitamin D deficient? I got an 11.4 on my test. Um, depending on the on the measurement, depending on what side of the pond you're on, because in the UK and Europe they measure it differently than we do in the United States. But if you're in the US, if you're at 11.4, you know, ideally you want that to be above 50, probably preferably somewhere around 70 to 100. Um, to get it to that level, it depends on your height, depends on your weight, depends on your sunshine, depends on your diet, depends on your level of inflammation. But a pretty uh, a pretty safe bet is anywhere between six to 10,000 units per day to get it up to that level. But if you're going to do that, you really should be following with your doctor and measuring it to make sure that you're not taking too much. I mean, at that dose, you're, it's highly unlikely you'd ever have a problem unless you have kidney damage. People with kidney damage should not high dose vitamin D unless they're being monitored and properly followed. Um, can low ferritin cause high blood pressure? Well, yes, it can. Anemia can cause high blood pressure. Um, and this is actually one of the, in my experience, this is a major cause of high blood pressure is, so forgive my drawing. Okay, in your neck, we're gonna do a frown here because this person's got high blood pressure. You have what are called oxygen or uh, baroreceptors, oxygen receptors that measure the oxygen concentration coming up your carotid arteries into your brain. So the oxygen getting to your brain, right? If the oxygen coming to your brain is not adequate because you're anemic, then your brain is gonna send a message to your heart. And it's gonna have your heart increased output. And that means constricting the blood vessels and increasing the pump. 
And so you get high blood pressure in an effort, you're increasing the pressure to drive more oxygen to the brain because there's not enough oxygen going to the brain. So the high blood pressure can go up. This is actually one of the causes of high blood pressure. Now, not everybody's blood pressure elevation is caused by a lack of oxygen, but this is something if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure and your doctor hasn't ruled out anemia, they probably ought to. That's a great question and right on topic. Uh, Patrice, I've just, I have an underactive thyroid, just been told that I have low folate and have to take uh, vitamin D for life. Uh, I don't know why you would have to take out vitamin D for life. I mean, that, to me, that sounds like not good advice. Um, you maybe need to take vitamin D temporarily and get your life squared away to where you're getting adequate vitamin D from the food and your sunshine. Um, I think that one was answered. Let's go down on the right. Yeah, so I think I answered most of those. Um, can you please explain pernicious anemia and how to fix it? Um, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take this as our last question of the night because we're 25 over. Um, Lorraine is asking, how do you fix pernicious anemia? Pernicious anemia is a lack of intrinsic factor. And, um, you know, you got to ask the question why you have pernicious anemia first. So in order to answer the question... We go back here. So again, I was talking earlier about these parietal cells, right? And these parietal cells, they don't just produce acid, but they also produce intrinsic factor. And so what happens in pernicious anemia is it's an autoimmune problem where you're making antibodies that can attack your intrinsic factor. Why is intrinsic factor important? Because when you eat meat or foods that contain B12, intrinsic factor has to pick it up. It's like a taxi cab. They, they form a, a, a complex. And intrinsic factor then carries that B12 down into your small intestine where it's absorbed into the bloodstream. And if you're, if you're producing antibodies in an autoimmune reaction that are attacking intrinsic factor, then you don't have adequate quantities of intrinsic factor. So your B12 becomes so low that you develop macrocytic anemia. And if you've got a good doctor and they've tested your intrinsic factor and your antibodies to intrinsic factor, then you hopefully will understand that your anemia is not just a B12 deficiency. It's an inability to properly absorb B12 from the diet when you eat it because your intrinsic factor is chronically under attack. So how do we fix this? Because this is really what needs to be fixed. We have to stop the antibody production on the intrinsic factor. This is an autoimmune process, and to stop an autoimmune process, you have to have four things done first. Four. And this is true of any autoimmune disease. But if these four things are not done, you'll never overcome the autoimmunity. Thing number one is the right diet. And this is different for everyone, but this is testing. Ask your doctor to test you for food sensitivity, food allergy. Ask your doctor to test you for gluten sensitivity. And um, very, very important. So measuring what you should and shouldn't eat. Number two, chemical exposure. Um, adjuvants and vaccines. Uh, heavy metals or toxic metals, um, food preservatives, food additives, food dyes. Many people react to these chemicals in a negative way, pesticides. So this needs to be measured because if you're reacting here and you can control it, you can change your diet, you can change your chemical exposures. Um, and you can, you know, again, that's step two in conquering autoimmunity. Step three in conquering autoimmunity is measure your vitamins and minerals because you, you can't heal without essential nutrients. And let me give you an example. Vitamin D deficiency can cause autoimmune disease all by itself without any other help. And, you know, vitamin and mineral measuring becomes very, very important as a tool for any doctor who's trying to help somebody who's struggling with autoimmune disease because these nutrients are important to regulate the proper reactivity or reaction of the immune system. And then the fourth thing is microbial balance. 
Microbial balance refers to your microbiome. Your microbiome, if it's off, if, if you've got overgrowth of certain types of microorganisms or undergrowth of certain types of microorganisms, that can alter the immune system in your gut. Remember, in your gut, 70 to 80% of your entire immune system is concentrated right behind your gut wall and largely influenced by the microbes that live inside of your GI tract. So a lot of times, this is why we'll see autoimmune diseases being induced by things like antibiotics because it wipes out the microbial balance. So these things all have to be measured. And then once they're measured, whatever is found, whatever is found, right, has, you have to take action on whatever you find. Because measuring, you know, knowledge without application is wasted. And so you got you to gotta seek this knowledge about yourself, and then you got to take action on whatever it is. And if you do that, you can say goodbye to that. Okay, that's how you would deal with it. So intrinsic factor or, or, or uh, pernicious anemia, again, it's an autoimmune type of anemia that, that leads to vitamin B12 deficiency, even though your diet may be or may have adequate or ample vitamin B12. Okay, I think that's a wrap. So there's more questions, but we just, I got to go home. I'm going to go home and eat dinner. So um, look, thanks for spending your Monday night. I hope tonight you learned something you didn't know that I've done my job if you have. Hey, look, as always, our mission and our goal is to save 100 million lives. And the only way I can do that with all the censorship in the world today, and we get censored every week, is for you to share. If you share this information with somebody you love and care about, it'll reach the right hands, and we'll reach that goal of saving 100 million. So help me help others. As I'm here helping you every Monday night, help me reach other people who also need this help by sharing and caring, because together we can change the world. So I'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hope you have a fantastic week. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week, we'll see you next Monday night.